Welcome everyone to Wednesday Night Bible Study here at BaysideLA.org and .com. My name is Pastor Steve Size, and I pastor the Great Church of Bayside Apostolic Center located in Torrance, California. Uh, we pray that you would be blessed today. Uh, we pray that uh, God would do something to you, speak a word into your life tonight. Uh, if you haven't already done so, I encourage you to download the uh, study uh, questions, and that way you can fill out uh, the blanks as we go through the lesson. But uh, I'm excited to bring to you tonight uh, this second part of the Lord's Prayer. This is the fourth segment of the Lord's Prayer. Verse 11 says, Give us this day our daily bread. This week we see Jesus make a transition to personal petition. When we ask God to give us our daily bread, we're acknowledging some important facts about who God is and who we are. God wants us to be at home with Him, living in prayer. We should pray as if everything depends on God. We have needs because we live in this world, and this prayer acknowledges the reality of those needs. But it also acknowledges the reality that God is the provider. God knows there's something we need greater than our daily needs, and that's an awakening of, to who He is, His power, his presence, His majesty, His will, and His kingdom. Jesus already knows what we ask before we even ask it. When we ask God to give us our daily bread, in essence, we're asking the bread of life, who is our spiritual bread, to also be the avenue whereby we receive the physical bread that we need simply to live life in this world. When we ask for daily bread, what we're saying is God you're the source of everything good in my life, and you've created my body with needs. We're privileged to ask for everything we need for our provision that day. God is teaching us that he's always enough for us. I won't have bread for life apart from Jesus Christ. We can quickly convince ourselves that we actually are self-sustaining creatures. One of the things that we can do in praying for our daily bread is not live based on assumption to pray and to ask the Lord for simple things. Up to this point, Jesus focused his model prayer on the name and the glory of God and his kingdom. This emphasis is instructive for us because it reminds us that prayer isn't primarily about what we can gain, but about the glory of God. Even when the model prayer shifts its focus to our specific needs, it does so by acknowledging our relative weakness and our need to trust God as our provider. In that light, Jesus told us that we should ask God, give us today our daily bread, Matthew 6, 11. Jesus used the metaphor of bread, the most basic provision for his audience, to say we should ask God to give us what we need to live and thrive in daily life. This request recalls the time during the Exodus when God provided his people in the wilderness. Having been miraculously delivered from slavery in Egypt, the Israelites crossed the Red Sea under Moses' leadership. But despite witnessing the wonders of God, they soon drifted into fear and complaining. The scripture says, I'm going to rain bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. Exodus 16.4 The people soon found that God was very serious about the specific nature of his command. For when they gathered more than they needed, the bread from heaven bred worms and it stank. <laughs> this is a powerful lesson for both the children of Israel and the children of God today. When Jesus told us to ask for our bread 
and to do it daily, he was reminding us that only God can provide what we need. In contemporary culture, we've taken innumerable measures for our self-protection. Everything from insurance policies to refrigerators to 401ks to seat belts, all of that is meant to keep us safe. These things are intended to provide for our needs. None of these things are inherently bad, yet there's a danger similar to the one the Israelites faced when they gathered too much bread from heaven. When we hoard for tomorrow, we might quickly forget just how weak and needy we are. So when we pray this portion of the Lord's Prayer, we're not only expressing our trust in God to give us what we need to survive, we're also acknowledging our own weaknesses and dependency on God's gracious provision to give us life. But what do we really need? What's this bread we're praying for? Certainly it means the basic necessities of life like food and water and shelter and even the breath in our lungs. And yet there's more because as Jesus would teach us, we don't live on bread alone. At the beginning of his earthly ministry, just after Jesus was baptized, the Spirit of God led him into the wilderness and specifically to be tempted by the devil. As in the Garden of Eden, the tempter again came to a man, this time the Son of Man. How would the second Adam respond to this temptation? Would he fall to his own human desires as the first Adam did? Or would he respond in faith? The tempter approached him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And this is what Jesus said. He answered, said, It is written, man must not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. It's Matthew 4, 3 and 4. We shouldn't miss the fact that Jesus, having fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, was definitely hungry. And a potential solution to his need for food was certainly within his grasp. To simply turn the stones into bread. Easy deal for him. But Jesus' response is a reminder that the daily bread we seek isn't merely physical. It's his word that sustains us. In fact, Jesus quoted the word of God in Deuteronomy 8 and 3 in his response. There Moses had told the Israelites who had eaten the bread from heaven that God had given them the bread to remind them that their true and greatest need was spiritual, not physical. Such is the case with us. When we come to God asking for our daily bread, we should be aware that our true need is in our souls. We need God and his word to tell us who he is, who we are, the nature of life, and the universe, and how we're supposed to live. As we pray for our daily bread, we can and should trust God to provide us for to provide for us physically. At the same time, we should pray for and give thanks for His willingness to meet our greatest needs, the needs that go beyond physical hunger to the spiritual hunger for Him that all of us have. No one knows for certain what today holds. And this might be a day of great joy or immense sadness. It might be a day of opportunity or a day of rejection. It might be a day of laughter or a day of tears. We simply don't know for sure. How wonderful then to know that even though we suffer from an almost paralyzing lack of knowledge, the Lord knows our end before our beginning, Isaiah 46 and 10. Though we don't know what today holds, God certainly does. How should we respond to that knowledge? In prayer, we respond by confidently asking the Lord to give us what we need, even though we don't know exactly what we need for that day. But because we trust His good character and correspondingly good provision, we can rejoice for we're confident that this day, no matter what it holds, is the day that God has made for us. And this was the exhortation of the psalmist in Psalms 118. This is the day that the Lord has has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Rejoicing in the day God has made means embracing 
the sovereign work of a loving God instead of wishing for another one. It means when we pray for our daily bread, we can do so with both joy and confidence. Bread is very basic in nature. For thousands of years, it has been one of the basic staples of life. But although bread provides what we might need for a given meal, it doesn't necessarily provide exactly what we want. Consider the Israelites during the Exodus. When the bread fell down from heaven, at first they were satisfied. But eventually, the bread grew boring to their taste buds, so they once again complained against Moses and the Lord. Why have you led us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There is no bread or water. And we detest this wretched food, Numbers 21 and 5. There's a considerable difference between what we need and what we want. When we pray then, we should be careful not to assume that praying for God to give us our daily bread means trusting that He will fulfill every one of our wants in exactly the way we think He should. If that were the case, God would function more like a cosmic butler than a heavenly father. Receiving our daily bread from God requires us to understand contentment. We must actively choose contentment when we consider God's provision, believing He has given us the right thing at the right time. That was Paul's point in Philippians 4. I have learned to be content, he said, in whatever circumstances I find myself. I know both how to make do with little, and I know how to make do with a lot. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being confident. Whether well-fed or hungry, whether in abundance or in need, I am able to do all things through him who strengthens me. Philippians 4, 11 through 13. In verse 13, it's often quoted, and we misunderstand its meaning, though, when we use this verse in a triumph sense to claim that Jesus will help us conquer any foe or meet any challenge. You see, because the contents, context indicates that Paul was specifically addressing the issue of contentment. Here was a man as he himself said, who knew what it meant to have little or to have plenty, to be well fed or to be hungry. And through Christ, he could be content whatever the Lord saw fit to give him on any given day. But we can't muster this kind of contentment on our own. Our faith must be in God who gives us our daily bread and who gives us strength to be content with his provision. Through faith in Jesus and in his strength, we can accept the bread he gives us and be joyfully content with it at the same time. All right, let's go to the fifth segment. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Jesus said we should ask God to forgive us as we have forgiven our debtors. Clearly, there's a link between our forgiveness of others and God's forgiveness of us. As we pray, it's good to remind ourselves that we truly deserve hell. But Jesus forgave us. The grace you extend is tied to the grace you receive. When I think about all that Christ did for me on the cross by taking my sins and bearing my shame, my guilt in his body on that tree, how can I not forgive someone who's done something against me? For us to ever come into the presence of a perfectly holy God and feel like we don't need forgiveness would be the greatest sense of arrogance. Unforgiveness of others closes our ability to receive God's forgiveness. One of the greatest sins in the church may be a lack of forgiveness, which stems from pride, and it stems from actually not preaching the gospel to ourselves. It is God who releases us from the power of our past, from the power of our sins. When we take those wounds and those anxieties and those aches and the and need of forgiveness or need of giving forgiveness, it then brings us to a place of humility because all we can rest upon is grace. No matter what somebody may have done to you, they have not done to you what your sins did to Jesus Christ. 
It's not that we forgive in order to gain God's forgiveness. It's that we forgive because we've been forgiven. Jesus does not ask us to do anything that he's not. For me to truly identify with him and who he is, that he's a forgiving God, is for me to be able to step out in forgiving others. When I freely and readily give you forgiveness, I am acknowledging how could I hold something against you that Jesus Christ, the King of the universe, has already let go. Jesus says you need to pray that way because what happens in your prayer life is manifested in your Christian life. When we ask for forgiveness of our sins, we're expressing faith in God's mercy. Our ongoing petition of forgiveness is an opportunity for God again and again to remind us of the good news of the gospel. It also is a chance for us again and again to humble ourselves before him and declare that we need his mercy. When we pray, we come into the presence of a holy God. This is a fearful prospect for when we come into his presence, our sins are starkly exposed. Time and time again in the Old Testament, when people met with God, they assumed a humble and even terrified posture, not only because of God's power, but also because in his presence, they realized with vivid and startling clarity the depth of their sin. The holiness of God brings to light the sin of human beings. And this is true without exception, for we are sinners without exception. No one can stand in the presence of a holy God. No one can claim righteousness when they see what righteousness truly is. Any excuses or buts crumble in God's presence. There's no bartering or trading for the only thing we bring into the presence of God is our own need. Our need for provision, for care, but most profoundly for forgiveness. Paul declared this truth in a universal way in Romans 3. He said, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It's no wonder then that Jesus taught that our pattern of prayer includes asking for forgiveness from God when he says, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. It's verse 12 of Matthew 6. Asking God for forgiveness of our debts or sins isn't a one-time plea, but a petition we make over and over again. For although we've been made righteous in Christ, we nonetheless commit acts of rebellion daily. We fail to live as the righteous sons and daughters God has declared us to be in Christ. When we pray then, we should make it our practice to ask for forgiveness. We should do so not only in a general sense, but also specifically. We should confess specific instances of jealousy, anger, lust, lying, cheating, and every other way we have fallen short of God's holy standard. We don't confess our sins to give God information. He knows better than we do the full extent of our sin. But we confess our sins to the Lord for the sake of our relationship with Him. God desires that we live in a love relationship with Him. He wants us to obey Him, but to do so out of love for Him. Not because somebody's forcing me. Not because pastor's saying, look, you better do it or else you can't be a part of our church. No, 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 no. God's intention has always been that we serve Him, that we uh, live for Him out of a love that has developed, amen, to Him from our heart to His heart. Amen. Because we love God and because we know He loves us, we confess sin. We don't want anything known but unspoken, to come between us and our Heavenly Father. We confess our sins so that our hearts can be unburdened and we can uh, be reminded again of God's limitless, gracious love for us. In Matthew 18, Jesus told a powerful story about the nature of forgiveness. He did so in, in response to a question from Peter about how many times we as humans needed to forgive others. Wanting to put a definite number on this forgiveness, Peter thought he was being generous by suggesting seven times. 
Jesus' response made clear that the issue wasn't uh, a specific number of times, but a heart that was always willing to forgive. In the story that followed, Jesus illustrated where our unwillingness to forgive others comes from. In his story, a servant owed a great debt to the king that he couldn't pay because he didn't have the means to pay his debt. Everything he owned, along with himself and his family, would be sold into slavery. In response, the servant threw himself on the mercy of his master, and the master of that servant had compassion, released him, and forgave him the loan, Matthew 8, 18, 27. Because the debt was enormous, the forgiveness of it was extravagant. I'm going to say that again. Because the debt was enormous, the forgiveness of it was extravagant. Yet the servant then went out to find a fellow servant who owed him a much smaller amount. And rather than following the example of his master, he violently demanded his payment in full, even throwing his fellow servant into jail due to his inability to pay. When the master received word of what had happened, he was incredulous. You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Shouldn't you also have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? Jesus then forged the link between God's forgiveness and our willingness to forgive other people. So also, he said, my heavenly Father will do to you unless every one of you forgives his brother or sister from your heart. Matthew 18, 35. You see, forgiven people forgive people. Let me say that again. Forgiven people forgive people. It's that simple. But the reverse is also true. When we find ourselves absolutely unwilling to forgive, it reveals that we don't comprehend the great debt of which God has forgiven us. Our lack of forgiveness shows that in our pride, we don't consider ourselves to be truly in debt to God because our sin was either not that grievous or not that extensive. Nothing could be further from the truth. Our sin cost Jesus his life. Our sin was so great that the required payment was the sacrifice of his own life. Knowing the devastating nature of our offenses, how could we withhold forgiveness from another person? As we pray, we must pray with one eye on our own sin and one eye on our brother's. We must make sure we aren't so arrogant as to ask God for his forgiveness while we're withholding forgiveness from someone else. Wow, that's powerful to me. Amen. And now let's go on to our last segment here of the Lord's Prayer. And that's segment number six. And that's simply this. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil or from the evil one. Uh, Another translation says, do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Both of these statements lead us to confront the real evil that's within us and around us. What God intends as a trial, Satan often intends as a temptation to sin. Satan's goal is to make you sin. God's goal is to help you grow in your discipleship and your sanctification. The devil gets us to buy into the lie that sin is okay because it's not a big sin. The devil tempts us in basically three ways. Number one, the lust of the flesh. Number two, the lust of the eyes. And number three is the pride of life. Being delivered from the evil one day by day is really just a foreshadowing of the fact that in the gospel, God has already delivered us from evil. There are three forces in the world that are affecting us as believers. Number one, the devil himself. Number two, the world. And then number three is our flesh. If I'm sensitive to the Holy Ghost, He reveals to me any unconfessed sin in my life so that I can be forgiven and walk blamelessly with the Lord. If it's not for God's protective grace with me, I will destroy my life. God, I need you to save me from myself. 
And if it's not your grace in my life, then I would be doomed. But your grace is dependable. Temptation at the very heart isn't specifically about sex, power, substances, or lying. At its root, temptation is really about trust. At the very heart of temptation is a simple question that must be answered. Can God really be trusted? Think back to those first moments in the garden. Everything existed in perfect harmony. And everything worked exactly the way God had designed it. There was no want, no dissatisfaction, no unmet expectations. And at the center of all this perfection was an unbroken fellowship between God and humanity. God and his created humans walked together in the garden, fully enjoying one another. Then came the temptation. Now the serpent was the most cunning of all the wild animals that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? Genesis chapter 3 verse 1. The question seems simple enough, yet the cunning nature of the serpent was revealed in the subtlety behind the words. The serpent was doing much more than asking the woman a question. He was leveling a charge at the character of God. With his question, the serpent was challenging the generosity and love of God as the provider. If God really loved the man and the woman, why was he holding back something from them? Surely, if he loved them, he would also give them access to the tree of of the knowledge of good and evil. Furthermore, if God was really generous, he would want them to have the very best, and clearly he didn't want them to have something this tree could provide. While the particular objects of temptation may have changed over the years, the charge against God is still the same. The temptation still begins with someone who doubts whether God and his ways can really be trusted. At the core then, temptation is not only about our willpower to say yes or no at a given moment, but also about whether we truly believe God loves us and has our best interest in mind when he gives his commands. Like our ancestors in the garden were weak people, offered an opportunity to doubt God in the face of temptation many times, and a lot of times we usually give in to that doubt. We would be wise then to recognize our weakness and practice praying as Jesus taught us. Don't bring us into temptation, but deliver us, Lord, from the evil one. You see, testing is valuable, whether in the realm of physical fitness, academic aptitude, or spiritual maturity. Tests are valuable for two reasons. First, Testing reveals the quality of what's already present in a person. For example, a test in a classroom shows how much knowledge an individual has learned. Secondly, a test is valuable in developing a person. For example, muscles never develop unless they are regularly tested. Similarly, the book of James shows the value of testing for our spiritual growth. We're instructed, consider it a great joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you experience various trials, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its full effect, so that ye may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. James 1, 2 through 4. Only through the testing of our faith do we grow into maturity. This purpose of test is one God used throughout the Bible and continues to use in our lives today. However, the evil one can corrupt such testing. As James pointed out, no one undergoing a trial should say, I am being tempted by God, since God is not tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed by his own evil desire. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, it gives birth to death. James 1, 13 and 15. Although God may allow his people to be tested, he does so only with our good and maturity in mind. But the evil one can take such trials and use them for his wicked purposes. 
according to James, the evil one works with our evil desires to corrupt this opportunity to grow and mature, using it as an opportunity to sin. This is a sobering thought for all Christians, for it reveals the fact that temptation doesn't come only or even primarily from somewhere around us, but from inside of our hearts. Corruption lives inside of us. The old self that died when we came into Christ still lurks there waiting for an opportunity to express the ways of the flesh. When we face temptation, we must recognize that our own hearts have put us in that position. James clearly described the progression that's at work here. Something or someone comes into our field of vision. Our hearts entice us to use that person or thing for our selfish desires and perceived needs. But even at this point, there's still time to resist temptation. We can choose whether to nurse and feed that temptation or to simply turn away. If we choose to feed our desire, it will eventually grow to consume us as we give in to sin. And finally, sin leads to death. As we pray for God not to lead us into temptation, we should be aware that temptation doesn't just come from external sources. We need to remain aware of what we're already capable of that arises from within our own hearts. You see, faith without action is dead. That is, faith is more than words or a feeling of certainty that God will come through in the end. When we pray, there are ways besides verbal confirmation to testify that we believe God will respond. For example, we might pray for a friend to have his financial needs met, but maybe God has chosen to answer that prayer through our financial involvement. We might pray that a sick loved one won't feel all alone, but maybe God has chosen to answer that prayer through our presence. When we pray that God won't lead us into temptation, but will deliver us from the evil one, the actions we take reveal the extent to which we trust God to do what we ask. In writing to the church in Corinth, Paul discussed temptation and identified a way we can put into action our faith in God. No temptation has come upon you except what is common to humanity. But God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation, will he will also provide a way out so that you may be able to bear it. 1 Corinthians 10.13 When it comes to temptation, we aren't alone. As Paul reminds us, no matter how great our temptation might seem at any given moment, it's common to all humanity. We aren't the first or the last to face such a temptation. In addition, the temptation isn't more than we can bear, for God in his faithfulness will give us a way out. This is where our action connects with our faith as we pray that God won't lead us into temptation but will deliver us from the evil one we know by faith then that God isn't tempting us furthermore we recognize by faith that God always provides a way for us to bear the temptation the action we need to take is simple we look for and we take that way out that God provides for us if we're lead if we're dealing excuse me if we're dealing with temptation by praying and expecting God to simply remove it from our lives we aren't putting our faith into action we aren't obeying God's word in 1 Corinthians 10 instead we're taking a passive stance toward our temptation playing the part of the victim who in the end might very well blame God for not taking away the temptation And finally tonight, a biblical approach to addressing temptation is to recognize the reality of temptation and not be surprised when it comes. We can pray about the temptation, but along with our prayers, we put our faith into action by actively looking for that particular way out that God has provided. We don't passively sit in the middle of temptation We express our trust in God's provision of a way out. 
And we do that by actively removing ourselves from the situation. So when we pray, we must recognize that our faith in God's willingness and ability to answer our prayers is measured not only by our words alone, but by what we do next. I pray this has challenged you today. The Lord's Prayer is a model prayer for all of us to take into account and to incorporate into our lives. I want everybody to be a successful Christian. I love you all. I pray God's blessing to you. We look forward. We invite you to come out to the depot uh, in Torrance, California, 1250 uh, Cabrillo Avenue in Torrance, 90501. Uh, You can also look on our website, BaysideLA.org, and find out the times. It's 11 o'clock on Sunday, and we look forward to seeing you there. We invite you to come out, and let's enjoy the presence of the Lord and the Word of God. And and bring somebody that needs God, needs the Holy Ghost, needs an experience uh, with God of mercy and of restoration, deliverance. Uh, God's into all of that. And God wants you to live life and not only live it, but to live it abundantly.